Hello, welcome to The Market Carver. I'm Adam Harder, Chief Investment Officer of Financial Enhancement Group. Thankful you once again gave us a few minutes of your time. Uh, I'm sure many of you are interested in our thoughts and what's turned to be a little bit more of a tumultuous market, at least so far in 2022. And so we're happy to uh, dive into the weeds a little bit deeper. Of course, I have Andrew Thrasher, our Chartered Market Technician and Portfolio Manager here with me as well. Uh, Andrew, I'm just going to dive right out there with how I was thinking about this week earlier and on Monday, and I, I suspect it's others as well. Um, but I think sometimes it's good to keep our own emotions in check. And I was thinking, man, this is uh, this is this is quite a uh, rocky market, not to any sort of nervous or, or panicky stand or anything like that. Just noticing it was a little bit more of a market movement. And I think it was it was worthwhile to take a step back and realize that at least a portion of that, why it seems a little bit harsher was just how little pullback we had last year. Uh, would you agree with that? I think that's a big part of it. We saw kind of something similar. It's, it's funny how often the market repeats. In 2017, very low volatile year. Market just pretty much kind of solely just trekked higher. Very similar to last year. Very, very We barely even had a 5% pullback in 2021. We turned the page, uh, bring in the new, the new year, and bang, start right off the bat with uh, – with some some volatility in the market, similar again to 2018 when that year started right off the bat um, in January and February. With uh, at the time it ended up being about a 10% decline, um, and here right now we were skirting on 10%, uh, depending on what indice you're looking at um, this go round. So I think often you see when you have those very low volatile years, they often get followed by a little bit more volatility the next year. Doesn't always happen, but it seems to be we're, we're playing out that scenario once again. Yeah, absolutely, and this is. Uh, in all real ex realistic sense, it's a normal environment. Of course, this is mm -hmm. the volatile end of it, but this is completely within a normal uh, market volatility. Yeah, yeah I think it's very I similar. Would, I, would I've, I've, I was going to say, I have a lot of I have, uh, friends and family in Florida. I think it's similar to when they're, when they say it's getting cold out, it's, oh, it's 50 degrees. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's it's three degrees here. So I think when it's when you get used to a certain environment, um, it doesn't take a whole lot to start uh, making it feel a lot different. Down there, it's 50 degrees. It's pretty cold. My parents are are trying to turn the heat on, uh, whereas if it was 50 degrees here, I think a lot of people in Indiana would start wearing shorts again outside. Yeah, now that's perfectly put. That that sums right, summarizes it uh, uh, perfectly. One thing we don't have a chart on, but I'm just going to take one second to, to reiterate, because uh, I think a lot of people are really into... Uh, what's driving this? Some people are thinking about macro events like Ukraine is certainly on the top of a lot of people's minds. Uh, and we just urge people to not ignore that noise. That is certainly a very important event that is in front of us. But the, the centerpiece of the market volatility, uh, macro events like that in, in Ukraine and Russia, uh, at least over my career and, and from those that I learned before that only serve to really get you on the wrong side of the ball. All right. That seems to get in and, and it serves the market serves to surprises. But really at the center of this is a, a change in real interest rates. And if you look at interest rates after you take away inflation, that's been really the change factor this year. Uh, last year, they were stuck around negative 1% all, all year, even though we had all this focus on inflation and all this focus on the Federal Reserve potentially change of policy, real rates after you subtract inflation were just hovering around negative 1%. And so they, as they become negative, uh, less negative, that has certainly been a strong influencer uh, on markets. And uh, I, I, I believe you would agree with that, but I'll give you a chance to say your two cents as well. I would agree. It, what, what makes a really interesting or breaking news story isn't always what flows over to the market. Um, we've talked about this in the past in our allocation meetings, looking at some of the big news stories. Um, for, for example, when we had the, the, the horrific incident of 9-11, and you had them, they actually closed down the market um, temporarily around that. But when the market did finally open, we did see stocks rally back. It was a horrific, a horrible, horrible um, terrorist attack, but the implications on the market was very short term. And we saw the same with, when you look back at the Gulf War, if you look back at a lot of different major, major events that are huge news stories, if they don't have financial implications, we often see the financial markets be able to digest that news a lot quicker. 
Now, that's not to say that's going to happen again with what's going on with Russia and Ukraine. Um, it very well could be something more drawn out and it could have financial implications. But we always have to keep in context, whatever's making a great news story isn't always necessarily a Wall Street story. We'll see if that happens this time, but that's a, that's a kind of a something we want to keep at the back of our mind that the two are separated. Oh, it, it absolutely, and and the whole point to financial markets is it's not easy to do so uh, because it's very visible uh, what's happening, and it's very common sense what what we think would happen. Uh, it just, as you say, Wall Street doesn't necessarily play out the same way. Uh, so let's take a look at our scheduled events and the things that we put there. Uh, enough of the ad libbing for now. Uh, we're talking about the growth carnage, uh, which is where the devastation has been on the stock market. Uh, the strong start to the year for international stocks, support levels for the market, and some key technical uh, levels that Andrew's been looking at. Uh, the steady spreads uh, in the yield market, specifically the high yield market, and then fertilizer prices. One of the things that will have our attention, we think, uh, as we go through the year. Uh, so let's just kick it off right here with our, our first slide and first topic which is the growth carnage. Uh, growth versus value is, is something that's always at least one part of our investment playbook. And uh, Andrew, I'll, I'll let you speak to this. I know you're familiar with a lot of these names. A lot of these tickers, I'll be frank with you, I, I, I don't recognize. I notice a chunk of them. Uh, but one thing is, is for certain, this is where some extreme selling has, has taken place. My wife loves to play word games. She's all about Wordle right now. And it's not that's not my area of expertise, but something I could do. You give me a list of, of ticker symbols. I could probably identify most of them. Uh, just the, the world I live in. Um, growth stocks are something that I pay a lot of attention to. Um, that's kind of one of the one of the themes and one of the markets that, that I often um, look for opportunities in. And so really, when we look at growth stocks, while the market was very strong last year, growth, the growth stocks, they really peaked in February, and March of 2021. They've had a really rough last almost 12 months, and it's really accelerated here recently. ARC is an ETF that's become extremely popular, in, um, invests in innovative companies, um, high growth stocks. And this is just looking at some of their their um, the positions and how far they've come from the 52-week high. You can see their stocks... Um, already down more than half, 80%, 60%. These are some some massively large companies. Um, DraftKings, um, Zoom. I think everyone was familiar with Zoom during the the when we all had the lockdowns. That's how we communicated a lot of the time. Tesla, T Doc, which is Teladoc, telecommunications with a doctor. Um, Coinbase, Twilio, Spotify, Shopify, one of the largest um, e-retailers. So these aren't um, tiny companies. These are some very large companies that have seen some very tough times when it comes to their stock price recently. And the market was able to digest a lot of that at the end of last year as some of the mega caps made up for the weakness of some of these other markets. And we're starting to see some of that now drag down some of those bigger companies as well. Um, again, like Tesla is down um, to, um, just about 20%. It's one of the top five largest companies in the country. Um, but just looking broadly at the growth market, there's been a lot of bloodshed in many of these names. Uh, maybe they'll present some opportunities in the future, but right now it's a lot of falling knives. Yeah, it's stunning in terms of the, the magnitude and the speed. And again, we point to real interest rates. Uh, seems like a really benign, boring topic. Uh, but that is exactly what's going on there, at least as, as a factor. Uh, when you have real interest rates and the negative, so a negative cost of borrowing money, these stocks can become a lot more appealing because you have no competition for money. Growth doesn't matter if it's next year or if the growth is 10, growth is 10 15, 20 years in the future when interest rates are negative. When they become starting to be positive, that's been a real challenge for the money and those stocks. Uh, those are domestic growth. Another kind of behind the scenes factor here, at least at the start of the year, uh, have been international stocks. Uh, we've got a nerdy chart here just for you engineers and those that like math like me and Andrew do. Uh, but this is this is looking simply at the performance over a three week span of the difference between international and domestic stock or right? those around the world in Europe and Asia, uh, Japan. Uh, the difference between those and here domestically. This has been an environment over the past 10 years that consistently has been domestic markets. has been U.S. leading the charge. The first three weeks of this year uh, has seen a very, very strong outperformance in international stocks. In fact, uh, we've plotted all of the three-week uh, periods going back over the past 10 years. Uh, they're in red on the far right uh, side of the chart, three standard deviations away, again, for you math nerds. Uh, a very unlikely and uncommon uh, event. Uh, we've seen some massive outperformance to international stocks. So what that means, 
Uh, we have been lighter in international stocks for a very long time. And that's been a good thing. That has served us well because we've had such stronger growth. When you have a move over this short of a period, all right, you can find some better growth that you'll miss out on on a short term. What we do from here, as we, we look for some normalization, we would by no stretch uh, expect a repeat. Uh, it could happen. It could happen. We just think it's it's unlikely. Uh, so we'll be monitoring this and see if there's any longer term uh, nature of an outperformance. And if so, that should give us an opportunity to rotate some of those dollars, which have been heavily in the United States to international. Uh, now, all along the way, Andrew, you'll remember there's there's been a few instances that look like international might turn the corner, but it just never did come about. That's very true. One of the, um, we look at it at FEG every week, uh, 18 different risk appetite ratios, looking at ratios of different things relative to the market. Um, some of those being EFA or emerging markets. And a lot of them have been getting worse. The relative performance of the market be getting worse as risk appetite started to decline. Um, something here recently that we started seeing improvement was the international. Um, we started seeing an improvement internationally relative to domestic markets. Um, and part of that has been influenced by what, what's going on in currencies um, and the dynamic of, of growth to value and some of the bond markets. They all kind of work together um, in sending different relative strength signals. Um, but we are starting to see some improvement internationally. And it's an area that's extremely underowned. Um, like Adam said, we haven't really been been dipping too, too big of a toe into international markets just because they haven't been keeping up with domestic. It's not worth taking on some of that risk to have a, a very large allocation. Um, if that begins to change, then that's potentially an area that we may begin looking at again, um, if that's where the market dictates and, the, and where the winds start to blow. Yeah, absolutely. That's been an opportunity we've been hoping that we have because it's healthy for the it's healthy for the portfolios. One of the implications, again, we come back uh, to the real interest rates. You're right. Uh, one of the side effects of that has been diversification has been so much more difficult. Putting together diversified portfolios is so much difficult because as interest rates, if they're driving uh, the downfall in stocks, they're also causing a downfall in bonds. So those two aren't able to work together. So if we're able to take that equity portfolio and diversify it, put it in different places around the globe, uh, I feel that we have a much healthier portfolio. Now, we won't do that uh, until we have some confirmation and, and some uh, really looks like this has lasting events, not just a three standard deviation uh, pull on a, on a bell curve. Agree, All right. So let's more. transition now to look at some support levels. We want to drill into the activity. This is something that we look at uh, very consistently. But when we start to have pullbacks exceed 5%, we really want to drill in on what the specific and precise levels. And I'm telling you, uh, I'm not just saying this because uh, I'm biased. I am. But we really do have the best technician, uh, the best technical mind uh, on the market. And so happy to have you, Andrew, drill in on these. I'm telling you. There's nobody better out there. So uh, take this one home, please. Yeah, so this is a chart that is only through last Friday. And we've had a lot of market movement um, since then. We record this video on, on Tuesdays. Um, just what happened yesterday uh, pretty much started to confirm what this chart was showing. Um, when we look at the market, the same supply support levels, the market really is, at the end of the day, a, a balancing act of demand and support. Where is there going to be a lot of where are demand and supply? Where is there going to be a lot of demand that comes into the market? And where maybe is there going to be supply that starts coming into the market? Whichever one's stronger is how we get markets to go up and down. So when we're looking at a stock chart like this, this is just the S&P 500 each day for the last couple months, almost a full year, we start saying, where is there most likely going to start being some maybe potential demand that comes back into stocks? And so what I start looking at are different moving averages, some previous lows, you can see here a, a dotted line on the last September low. Um, looking at the one year average, average price over the last one year. And then also psychologically looking at that 10% level. At what point does the market, if it continued to go lower, which it, it did on Monday, do we hit the point where we've now declined 10%? Historically, when we get to that 10% level, that's where a lot of potentially institutional investors saying, okay, We've dropped 10%. This is where we want to start maybe buying the dip or starting to maybe increase our risk exposure just from the pure fact that the market was down 10%. So what was really interesting is when we start combining all of these different possibly support levels, they all started to converge on one area, and that was about 4,300 on the S&P 500. So we, we put this chart together over the weekend um, when I do a lot of my charting, and then on Monday, that's pretty much where the market went right away. Um, we undercut it, and then it, it rose and closed above 4,300. 
while recording this video, we saw again support test at 4300. So it's it's con we're trying to confirm some of those support levels that demand is coming back to the market. Hopefully it holds for the rest of the week. We still have a lot of news to digest and a lot of market moving events um, the remainder of this week. But right now it looks like so far that we are seeing some buyers come back into these support levels. And that's a good sign that there is still maybe at least a healthy bit of demand within the equity market. Um, this isn't something we'll act on alone, but we do want to get confirmation that there is still some demand at these levels. And maybe we can start looking for opportunities um, if we start seeing some more bullish signs in the market. Yeah, and you couldn't be more right in, in terms of the, the digestion, not just from a, a big picture level, but uh, we're now through the thick of, of earnings season. I think well, it'll be a very important one just in terms of setting expectations for the year. We have three of our portfolio stocks reporting in the morning. Uh, and so these are some of the days I look forward to, believe it or not. Uh, uh, we never drill into the, the really details and look for the absolute minutia of this quarter. Uh, but we do want to pay attention to the bigger drivers and the themes behind those stocks. So we, we've got a, the big news at the top and then we're really getting through the heart of earnings season here in the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. OK, now to uh, high yield spreads. This is something that Andrew and I spend, uh, you know, there are things where we segregate our work and we focus on different things. Uh, and there's some areas where we, we both have eyes on this. Uh, and the yield spread market is something where we both pay a lot of attention to because it's that important. I thought, Andrew, this is one of the mm -hmm. better looks in of this chart. I really appreciated this. So uh, being your chart, please drive this one home. And, and really the best news that they're going to hear all week, at least at the time that we're able to record this. Yeah. So when we when we talk about equity markets, we never want to then, of course, discount what's going on in fixed income. They often say the smart, the smartest guys in the market are on the bond desk. Um, I think that's why often Adam's the one that's looking at more bond charts or bond data than I am. He's, he's a smart one on our team. Um, but often when the fixed and when we start seeing market weakness in equities, like we've seen uh, markets come down five, 10 percent, we want to turn and say, is the same type of nervousness being shown on the fixed income side? Are bond traders also starting to get a little worried? One way we can evaluate that is looking at the spread, the difference in yield between high yield, those riskier junk bonds and treasury debt or a high yield um, or risk-free interest rate. There's different ways to kind of look at the spread, but looking at comparing it to treasuries. If we start seeing that spread widen, it means the fixed income market's requiring a, a higher yield, a higher payment to own that fixed income debt. Um, we can see on this chart here in the kind of very middle during the 2008 financial crisis, the fixed income market was requiring a very high uh, premium to own uh, high yield debt. That spread was very, very high. And so that's when the spreads begin to widen, it's telling us that the fixed income market's concerned. So let's bring that back to today. Are we starting to see the same nervousness in fixed income based off the high yield spread? Short answer is no. So what this chart looks at at the very bottom is the green is the high yield spread. And you notice there's lots of big chunks missing. That's because I only wanted to show the data when the market was down 8% as it was on Friday and say, okay, looking at every other time the market's been down 8%, where was the high yield spread? And what we found was actually on Friday, it was one of the lowest high yield spreads when the market was down this much. So that's telling us that when the market's been down at least 8%, historically, they've always been demanding a higher premium for that for to own high yield debt, suggesting that currently the fixed income market isn't as worried as the equity market is about some of the developments going on potentially in the Fed or, or as Adam was talking about earnings season that's coming out. Um, all we know is right now the fixed income market is still more confident than equities and if history is right, then then they're often the ones that are that went out and we should maybe see, start seeing equities improve from there. Or we start seeing high yield markets play catch up and we start seeing yields uh, yields rise higher on the high yield side. Um, and then they play catch up to what the equity market's showing on, on their concern. But as of right now, it's an encouraging sign that high yield spreads are staying pretty low, one of the lowest levels when we've seen stocks drop 8% like they are right now. Yeah, absolutely. And, and why that's one thing we have to pay attention to. I'll also connect that to one of the reasons. So some things are just happen to be what we call spurious correlation and they just happen to be coincidental. Uh, and those are important uh, because they alert you to market conditions and, and market uh, fundamentals. But here's a real dynamic. Um, when those real when those yield spreads change, it really impacts some leverage players in the markets. Uh, really, the important players are the large institutional pension funds insurance companies and banks. And when yield spread widen, that means that they're taking losses on their assets, the things that they own. They're big time owners of riskier types of debt. And so that really happens their ability to add other type of risky assets. 
Uh, and so when, when those spreads are narrow, their books are fine. And so they kind of look around and don't see what all the fuss is about. Uh, and they're able to keep on and, and keep on investing. Uh, and so that, that's a, a really good sign to see that continue. Uh, and so I think we've got mm -hmm. one more thing to talk about, and that is uh, fertilizer prices. And we think food security, food production uh, all around the globe are going to be very important this year. Um, and this, of course, ties back to, to natural gas and the prices that we see in, in Europe. Uh, I've taken a really escalation. I actually I come from a farming family, so I had some of these conversations in terms of uh, the cost of fertilizer in uh, December, and it only got worse from there. Uh, Andrew, you were doing the point of this out, and I know this is something that you're looking at in uh, potential stocks and potential commodities to own as well that can benefit from this. Yeah, I think commodities are going to be a big theme in 2022. Um, it's but Adam said he comes from a farming farming family. I do not. I go uh, the only farming or hunting I do is at Kroger. Um, so I often will say, hey, here's something I'm seeing in commodities and try to get his expertise on is that is this really a big deal? Is this really actually something impactful for, for the ag space? And from what Adam's been saying, kind of confirming what I've, I've been reading with the data and some of the news stories has been the record rise in natural gas that we saw here in the U.S. pales in comparison to what happened over in Europe. The cost of energy over there has been truly a crisis. And I know that word gets thrown around quite a bit, but it really has been a crisis in, in Europe and Asia with the cost of energy there. And when the natural gas prices went up, ours came back down, theirs never did. And unfortunately, that had a big impact on the cost of fertilizer, which is made, um, of course, from, from natural gas. And so as farmers in Europe were starting to um, buy their fertilizer, they Historically, they, they pretty much have all that done, um, and then maybe it's the same in the U.S., but from what I read, they have pretty much all done in December. This year, only maybe 70% of fertilizer was able to be um, acquired there. And so really having some big concerns over a potential supply of, of crops in Europe and also in Latin America, and it's, ha it's having an issue here in the U.S. as well as fertilizer prices here are rising. Um, and so I think this is this could have a potential impact as we're not able to plant as much possibly because of the lack of fertilizer. And also if we have poor weather conditions, they said it could be catastrophic there in Europe um, if they have a drought or something happens by, by April just because they don't have the nutrients in the soil to really get the crop they're going to need. And so this is something that we're continuing to be very closely monitoring, watching the ag space, watching some of the individual commodities, as we think this will be a topic that will continue to pop up throughout the year. Uh, but most recently, we're starting to see some of the, the bigger news outlets are starting to report on it. This this chart came from Bloomberg um, about the record high Europe, uh, European fertilizer prices um, as people are starting to pick up on on this is becoming a pretty big issue uh, internationally. And it very well could be an issue here in the U.S. as well. Yeah, and, uh, and a lot of eyes will be on the web there. You're right. As, as, as so many things, this is uh, God's control and uh, it's going to be weather dependent, you know, who knows? So we could very well get some, all the conditions to line and have the weather that we need. And, and that's what we'll hope and pray for. Um, but that may not be what's in the cards and that's what we have to be looking out for. Uh, Hey, thank you so much for giving us, uh, some of your time. Please let us know, uh, what you think of this new format, any tips. I know we've went a little bit longer here because we tend to drill in and stay on, on topic a little bit more, but if you have any feedback, things you'd like to see us talk about or, or suggestions, please let us know. Uh, don't forget, you could uh, schedule your complimentary meeting, scan the QR code or give us a call or, or also listen to our radio show. Consider this uh, on the airwaves, 93.1 WIBC or through a more convenient podcast form. Thanks again and have a great weekend. Mm -hmm.